I'll end the relationship with compassion, I promise. A couple of years ago, this story was recounted as true. It still needs to be verified, but the warning is real. Tinder is the go-to online dating connector in most of the US. My experience with Tinder, or at least with the connection it made with a specific man, was a dream from heaven at the beginning. He was handsome, charming, and flirtatious in a most delightful way. This dream turned deadly. It all began when I was at night school at the community college. I was studying to get my CNA, Certified Nursing Assistant. The classes were required and not very exciting. Sometimes the lecturers droned on like Ben Stein in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You can imagine just how bored I was listening to these monotonous lessons every night. Sometimes I'd pretend to be listening and taking notes on my tablet, but I'd be surfing Tinder. I'm single and attractive, or at least I think I'm beautiful and with a good sense of humor, but I have had no dates in months. I was hopeful for success in online dating to find a match. I recalled messaging this one guy. His picture and profile were precisely my type of guy. He loved being out in nature, hiking, camping, and dreamy picnics along picturesque streams. There was a selfie of him in front of a campfire, and many of him cutting beautiful steaks cooked over an open flame. He was very competitive, as he had pictures of him and a friend having a playful knife throwing contest. I love that spirit of having fun. In the subsequent communications, I discovered more about him. He was a hunter and enjoyed fishing in his free time. His calm and gentle manner gave me great vibes. None of the other guys on Tinder had such charisma. We video chatted and made plans for a first date. I told my best friend about the planned date, and she checked his social media and sent me his Facebook page. I instantly could see that he was already in a romantic relationship. She was in every picture with him, all cuddly and sweet. I went crazy and sent him a text asking him why he had led me on when he was in a relationship. He responded immediately, saying he planned to break up with her to be with me. He just had yet to do it. I hated the thought of being a home wrecker, but gosh, he was so irresistible, and he gave all the assurances I was what he was looking for in life. We had so much in common. I messaged him back saying, so, you're willing to end that relationship to be with me? Yes, I'll end it tonight. I asked him how does he think she would take the news. Don't worry, I'll end it with compassion. Sometime around 2 a.m., my phone buzzed with a message. I was half asleep, but saw it was my tender connection and opened the message. To my horror, he had sent a picture of his girlfriend. She was mutilated. It was her. I recognized her face through the blood and slice marks that covered her face. The morning news was full of pictures of the murder. The police were investigating the homicide where a hunting knife was used in a grotesque killing. My Tinder match had taken his girlfriend's life, but this story is even more disturbing because I remember so clearly him telling me, and I quote, he was going to end the relationship with compassion. Little did I know that his hunting knife was named compassion. The police found it etched onto the blade. Last year was hectic, with moving out of state to start a new job. I had graduated in the spring and took a terrific opportunity on the west coast, but I needed more time for dating. I've never used a dating app, but it made sense with my schedule, so I signed up on Tinder. It couldn't hurt, and I probably will have better success than I have been having. I was surprised when I hit the search in my area, and a beautiful girl's profile appeared. She had a gorgeous smile and perfect olive skin. She was so perfect I was instantly worried. This was one of those fake profiles trying to catfish me in some way. I read her profile and decided she was real, and I had just gotten lucky. I clicked message and shot her a quick hello. A few hours later, we were chatting online. We had a great time and exchanged a few photos, so I knew that there was no way her account was fake. We exchanged more precisely where we lived, and she turned out to be in a suburb a few miles west of mine. So, we were very close to each other. Since the following evening was Saturday, we planned to meet. She invited me to her house at 11 p.m. with the idea we go to the midnight movies. It was a popular thing to do in this town. She sent me her address, and it was a street in a very high-end neighborhood, 
As I drove there that evening, I was impressed with the houses on the street. All were big with beautiful front lawns. Every home was immaculate, and each had flower beds and ornamental trees. When I arrived at her address, it was this fantastic mansion. I sent her a text saying I was out front, and to be sure I was at the right place, please come out. She texted that she was with a friend, and asked if I could pick her up there. She sent me another address. This address wasn't even close to the first address. I found this a bit odd, since our date was planned far in advance. As I got closer, my GPS indicated I was to turn onto a dirt road. It wasn't well maintained, and the trees grew very close to the road and hung over, making it a kind of tunnel to drive through. I was getting a little creeped out and finding this dark road spooky. To make matters worse, this was pretty far out in the country, with few houses around. I know I should have heeded all the warning signs flashing in my brain, but my supposed date was super hot in all her pictures, and we really seemed to click and chat. So I ignored all the red flags and dismissed every negative thought. A recount had to be real, I reasoned. A quarter of a mile down this rutted dirt road was a dilapidated old farmhouse. It looked abandoned, except for a few lights burning inside and a dirty yellow porch light. There weren't any cars or signs of anyone having come or gone from the house in a long time. I called my date and said, I'm outside a farmhouse, is this the correct address? She says yes, I'll be right out. Thinking this is a setup, I loosen my collar just in case I have to fight. I'm not a little guy, and I've remained in pretty good shape, so I'm not terrified of many people. So I'm standing by my car, and this woman in a black veil comes out of the house. She's wearing a long black dress and carries what I can only describe as voodoo charms in one hand and a voodoo doll in the other. I'm sure this is some kind of prank and she has a fantastic sense of humor, so I try to laugh and be entertained. I'm waiting for a bunch of her friends to jump out of the house with video cameras and laugh their heads off at my expense. Nonetheless, this was pretty weird, giving me the jitters. But no one with a video cam jumped up to surprise me. The woman stood there in the yellow porch light, and the realization that this wasn't a prank or a candid camera moment flushed over me. In the corner of my eye, another figure in a similar black dress came from around the corner of the house. In her hand, I saw the glint of a sword about two feet long above her head flash in the moonlight. It was clear that if I stood my ground, I would be skinned alive by two psychopaths. I jumped into my car and spun out of the drive toward the dirt road two blasts from a double barrel shotgun as a chaser behind me. I was driving like a madman trying to save my life. When I was back on the main road and in civilization, I called the police. I gave them my story, and they said they would send a patrol to check out the farmhouse. A few minutes later, an officer called me to get more information. He was at the farm and said it was abandoned, and that he knew the family that used to live there, and no one had occupied that house in years. The officer made his report that the farmhouse was vacant with no sign of any intruders. It appears I was set up on Tinder by a beautiful picture of a girl to lure me to that remote location, to perform some kind of satanic ritual or voodoo witchcraft. I deleted my online dating app and have no intention of ever going on a blind date again. My advice is to always use caution on a first date and always go to a public area with other people around, just in case things go badly. I've heard horror stories of dates gone badly, and certainly had read the news stories of online dates who turned into serial killers and gruesome things like that. But in my wildest dreams, I never would have believed that I would have an experience so disturbing on a date. Every morning when I look in the mirror, I'm reminded of that terrifying night. The scar on my face isn't as deep as the scar on my emotions. I'll carry that deep wound for the rest of my life. The brutality of that date night's event I cannot erase from my mind. Before I fall asleep at night, the memory still racks my body and shivers in cold sweats. I have resisted sharing this story for a long time. The therapist has counseled me into recovery, advising me to let go by telling my story. It is a terrifying chapter of my life that I must close the page on. Here goes. If you're a sensitive person, turn away now. I was in graduate school putting in long study hours. 
I didn't want to neglect my social life, but somehow it got on the back burner. My few friends in class were teasing me that I was becoming a reclusive nerd and that I needed to breathe some fresh air into my life with a few nights a week enjoying life. They encouraged me to open a Tinder account. They even helped me write an enticing profile and select pictures not photographed in the library. I posted and entered the site, swiping all the girls anywhere near me. My guy friends said to click them all and see what comes to the surface. They did warn me that some of the gorgeous girls were catfish accounts and would only lead to a dead end or loss of my cash, as they are just swindlers, probably not even girls. I sat patiently for the next two days, waiting for a match to emerge. My self-esteem melted like ice cream on a hot summer day. Not a single match. At 23, I thought I was going to be single forever. As each hour passed, my anxiety festered and my desperation mounted. I prepared for bed and had just pulled up the covers when my phone dinged with a notification. At a glance, I saw it was Twitter. I sat up and opened the dating app. The name Amanda appeared below a cute picture of a dark-haired girl. She had a beautiful smile. There was only one photo, but so cute. Her bio was clearly written and a little humorous, with some funny remarks about her being the sweeter twin sister in The Better Date. It was a little strange, but not wacko. Not 20 minutes passed, and my cell phone dinged with a message. Hi, it's me, Amanda. I'd love to chat in person with you if you're free. A string of emojis expressing happiness followed. I was super excited. I saw in the profile she was just a few miles away. I asked for her address and she sent me immediately. I was again surprised at how quickly she was giving personal information. My mind was darting to fears that this was a catfish, but then I'd look at her photo and all that fear melted away instantly. I responded, excellent, I'll be at your place in an hour. I quickly showered and was dressing when my cell phone dinged with another Tinder match. Wow, my lucky day two matches. I opened the app, and a profile very similar to Amanda's popped up. It was Amanda's profile in a similar picture, but the name was Miranda. The profile said very similarly to Amanda's, I'm the hotter twin sister, consider dating me. Could this really be the twin sister? It made sense. They both looked very much alike in appearance, and the names Amanda and Miranda lent very nicely to twins. Distance on the app showed to be very similar as well. The only weird thing was that they were slamming the other in their profiles and claiming to be the better pick. A minute later, a message comes saying, don't date my sister Amanda, date me. The thought of being desired by twins fighting over me was crazy. I was smiling from ear to ear, but why choose one over the other came to my mind. And I wrote back, why don't the three of us get together and have a triple date? Miranda responded, Okay, let's do it, but you better like me more. My mind was on hyperdrive. I couldn't believe that I was going to have a date with twins. Is this a dream come true or what? Two beautiful girls, one on each arm. This is a guy's wet dream. I literally danced out of the house to my car and drove to the address they had sent me. It was a very modest house in a rundown area. I parked on the street and rapped on the door with my knuckles. Surprisingly heavy footsteps approached from inside followed by the turning of a deadbolt. The front door creaked open as if in the agony of seldom being used. I chewed a breathman to give a good first impression. As the door opened in protest, my mouth shut in shock. There at the door was a girl with two heads attached to the neck to the same body. They were conjoined twins. The head on the right said in a bright and welcoming voice that eased the tension. Hi, come in. I'm Amanda. I'm the pretty sister. And this is Miranda, my ugly sister. Speak for yourself, Amanda. He'll definitely prefer me. Welcome, I'm Miranda. I honestly didn't know if I should turn and run or enter, but both were saying, come, come, let's get this party rockin'. I flipped a coin in my mind, closed my eyes and stepped forward. The house was immaculately clean and the dining room table was beautifully set. They had me sit and they went into the kitchen to return with two plates of a wonderfully prepared steak. The meat looked beautiful and the aroma was fabulous. It set me at ease and I began to relax. The twins sat across from me at the table and Amanda picked up a knife and Miranda a fork and together they cut the steak in front of them. Then each with a fork fed themselves. It was so unbelievable I could not focus on cutting my own steak. 
I just sat there and stared, and strangely couldn't believe I was on a date with conjoined twins. Why aren't you eating your steak, dear? Did I not prepare it the way you like? I told you I should have cooked it. He doesn't like your cooking. I didn't ask you, Miranda. I hate you, Amanda. I wish you were not my sister. What a blessing I don't have to share your brain. Amanda, Miranda, please stop fighting. I'm just full. I had a big lunch this afternoon. The food is delicious. Then Miranda asked, who do you think is the prettiest? It's me, right? Then Amanda spoke. He obviously prefers me over you. The argument continued with Amanda saying she was born on the right side because she's always right. This went back and forth, building an intensity. The tension in the house was white hot. I raised my voice to shout over the two of them, saying if they didn't stop arguing, I was leaving. And with this, both the twins looked at me and their eyes went dead. You could hear a pen drop. The twins rose to their feet as one, each with a fork in their hand. In one scary voice, they said, you aren't going anywhere. They moved around the table, each with a fork raised. I looked into their eyes and all I saw was fury. A fork in Miranda's hand slashed downward, catching me and tearing four rows of bloody pain across my cheek. Amanda then shouts at Miranda in rage. What did you do that for? He's mine. Then they lashed out at each other with separate hands stabbing the same body with their forks. The blood spurted from the wounds and splattered over my body. Both their heads tilted back and the two as one fell to the floor. I called an ambulance and paramedics took care of them. Where they are today, I don't know. Emily was tired of being single. She had tried going out to bars and clubs, but nothing ever seemed to work out. So she decided to try something new and went online with Tinder. After swiping left and right for a few days, Emily came across a guy named Mark. They started chatting and hit it off right away. Mark was charming and funny, and Emily felt like she had finally found someone who understood her. They agreed to meet up for drinks at a local bar. Emily was nervous but excited to finally meet Mark in person. When she arrived at the bar, Mark was already there waiting for her. He greeted her with a warm smile and a hug, and they sat down to order their drinks. As the night went on, Emily and Mark talked about everything from their favorite movies to their hopes and dreams for the future. Emily was starting to feel like she had found her soulmate. Mark seemed like the perfect guy, kind, caring, and attentive. Towards the end of the night, Mark excused himself to go to the bathroom. When he came back, Emily noticed something strange. There was a glint of metal in his pocket that she hadn't noticed before. It looked like a switchblade knife. Emily's heart started to race. Was Mark dangerous? Had she made a mistake by agreeing to meet him? She tried to stay calm and continue the conversation, but she couldn't shake the feeling of unease. As they were getting ready to leave, Mark leaned in and kissed Emily on the cheek. I had a great time tonight, he said. Let's do it again soon. Emily forced a smile and nodded, but inside she was terrified. She couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about Mark. She decided to do some research on him when she got home just to be safe. The next day, Emily discovered something shocking. Mark had a criminal record for assault and battery. He had also recently been released from prison for killing his ex-girlfriend with a switchblade knife. Emily felt sick to her stomach. She had been flirting with a murderer. She couldn't believe she had been so foolish to trust someone she had met online. She immediately blocked Mark on Tinder and tried to put the whole ordeal behind her, but it wasn't over yet. A few days later, Emily received a package in the mail. It was a small box wrapped in black paper with a note attached. The note read, I'm sorry for scaring you. I just want you to know that you're not like my ex. I would never hurt you. Emily's hands were shaking as she unwrapped the box. Inside was a switchblade knife, just like the one Mark had been carrying at the bar. Emily's heart sank. She knew that Mark was still out there watching her every move. She called the police, but they told her there wasn't much they could do. Mark hadn't technically broken any laws by sending her the knife. Emily was on her own. For weeks, Emily lived in fear. She was constantly looking over her shoulder, wondering if Mark was going to come after her. She stopped going out at night and started carrying pepper spray with her everywhere she went. Then one day, Emily received another package in the mail. This one was much larger than the first, and it was addressed to her parents' house. She opened it with trembling hands, afraid of what she might find inside. To her horror, the box contained a note and a bloody switchblade knife. The note read, I told you I would not hurt you. I'm a man of my word. I didn't hurt you, did I? Emily's worst fears had been realized. 
Mark was still out there and he was getting closer. She knew that she had to do something before it was too late. Emily decided to hire a private investigator. She was determined to bring him to justice and make sure that he never hurt anyone else again. The investigator was able to track down Mark's address, and Emily decided to confront him in person. She drove to Mark's house, her heart pounding in her chest. She wasn't sure what she was going to say or do, but she knew that she had to face him head on. When she arrived, Mark was sitting on his porch. He looked up when he saw her and smiled. Hey Emily, what are you doing here? Emily took a deep breath and stepped forward. I know who you really are, Mark. I know what you've done, and I'm not going to let you hurt anyone else. Mark's smile faded, and his eyes grew cold. What are you talking about, he asked. Emily pulled out the switchblade knife that Mark had sent her in the mail. I know that you sent me this, she said, and I know that you killed your ex-girlfriend with a knife just like this one. Mark's face contorted with anger. You don't know anything about me, he spat. You don't know what she put me through. You don't know what it's like to be pushed to the edge. Emily took a step back, realizing too late that she was in over her head. But it was too late. Mark lunged at her with his switchblade knife, and Emily barely had time to defend herself. The fight was brief but brutal. Emily managed to disarm Mark and knock him to the ground, but she was badly wounded. She stumbled back to her car and called 911 waiting for the ambulance to arrive. Mark was arrested and charged with attempted murder. Emily was rushed to the hospital, where she underwent emergency surgery. She survived, but just barely. The experience changed Emily forever. She learned that not everyone is whom they seem, and that even the nicest person can have a dark side. She also learned to trust her instincts and be more careful in the future. But most of all, Emily learned to be grateful for every day she had. She knew that she had come dangerously close to losing her life, and she vowed to never take anything for granted again.